So I guess in high school, uh, math was always a somewhat easy, uh, easy subject for me. I, but I wasn't that interested in mathematics in high school. It was maybe somewhat just calculating, and uh, I come from South Africa. Uh, there weren't these uh, opportunities to learn more advanced mathematics in high school. So my interest in high school, since I was interested in mathematical-like things, was I was uh, essentially a professional chess player. So I started out playing chess in competition, very involved with chess. Um, man, most of my school time in high school was involved with that. Um, when I went to university, I was introduced to abstract mathematics, more abstraction and the way that you could argue by abstraction and uh, understand something very deep by pure thought and structure and the way things fit together. And at that point, I gave up chess and uh, never looked back. So. Um, math began for me as an undergraduate, not really in high school. And uh, after a couple of years of undergraduate, it was clear to me that this is what I want to do. Uh, I come from a family, not an academic family, so they, the idea that you could make a living doing mathematics was not... In fact, my father, many, uh, for many, many years, would say, why do they pay you to do this? <laughs> so, yeah, that's my sort of history in mathematics. And once I started doing it, I, I never looked back. And um, I then continued to study in the United States and moved there for, for good. Um, and the more I learned, the more I enjoyed it. Well, you never know that you can make a living doing something. Uh, the mathema being, making a living doing math mathematical research is clearly a luxury, and one can't assume that one can have that luxury. But you go do a PhD, uh, and when you do a PhD, you hope you make a contribution to the subject which will advance, but not for the purpose of getting a job. Uh, not everybody who gets a PhD should think they're going to be a researcher. They could go into industry, they could do many other things. Today, getting a PhD in mathematics is a very good training for any kind of thing. But of course, I wanted to be, I wanted to spend my, I wanted to earn money doing, thinking about pure mathematics. And uh, that meant doing a PhD and hoping that you could get a job. Um, I'm lucky it worked out very well, but I never assumed it would work out. So I think when I was doing a PhD, I always felt, well, if I have to, become a teacher, it would be fine. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy teaching. I uh, maybe don't teach that much, but I enjoy teaching. Uh, and I very much enjoy having graduate students. I've had very many graduate students, and they uh, often you learn as much from them as they learn from you. Maybe more you learn from them. So um, the ability to do research, and teaching, and uh, have graduate students is a luxury that you can have in universities. and. Uh, I was lucky to get good jobs, and uh, even today I still have a very good job. So I think maybe there, there are different kinds of mathematicians, and they categorized into problem solvers, into theory builders, into big thinkers. Uh, my view is that uh, mathematics is really very small, not big. It's small. There aren't that many great ideas, and people use the same idea over and over again in different contexts. And a lot of mathematics, uh, sort of, some subject is developed, just some structures are developed in some direction, and then the people who trained in there might move in some direction. And then it's a big shock when that comes and it's useful in some other context, but it's not really a shock because often that, that was developed or thought of in order to understand something. And then people forgot that application and then developed the machinery so that it, it then becomes extremely powerful on a, by itself. And only later people come and understand that it's related. So, in fact, I don't have a field. I mean, my main interest is whole numbers, the theory of whole numbers, equations in whole numbers, prime numbers. But in order to study uh, what's called Diophantine equations and prime numbers, the tools, uh, and this makes it very attractive, and for some people less attractive, 
but the tools that are used are from all over mathematics, from algebra to analysis to geometry to dynamics. So I'm willing to use anything to solve the problems I'm interested in. So it's more like I get interested in something and then think about it for some number of years and eventually you don't have new ideas and then you move a little bit to the side and maybe you find what you were thinking about there uh, is useful here and then all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, I'm stuck here but actually this idea is useful there. So I don't really have a field. Uh, there are many people who are very focused in some direction and they go extremely deeply into something. Um, my feeling is you always have to go deeply, but you, the breadth is something very attractive. And I should say that uh, I don't, the French system in mathematics is fantastic. They got great mathematicians. So obviously it works extremely well. But I came from South Africa and the big choice I had to make was most uh, students from South Africa who are lucky enough to get an education. This is due in the middle of apartheid. So I, I was lucky to be white, obviously, and I was going to get out of that country because it was a very bad place. Today it's a marvelous place, by the way. Um, so when I finished, uh, the advice I would get from my teachers was, well, you go to England and go to Oxford or Cambridge. But I looked then, you would specialize extremely quickly. The idea in England is you come in and either you'll get a thesis and you'll try to become an expert in one little thing. And I didn't find this interesting at all because it, one of the beauties of mathematics is how it's a great unity and how algebra and analysis come together. So in, a, in the US, the programs are a bit slower and you get a broad education starting from the undergraduate. So you have four years undergraduate and, and you haven't even learned that much mathematics. Unlike here where they start undergraduate, they're already very strong. In the US, uh, the graduate school is where people learn the real skills. And it's a broader education because you've got this broader undergraduate. And this I found much more attractive and it suits me very well. So uh, you ask about a field. Uh, I work in number theory, but I will use anything, and I like to feel I have some intuition about a number of different fields. And in fact, some of the most interesting things that I've been lucky to do, lucky enough to achieve, uh, do involve relating diff unexpectedly fields. And uh, and when you do that, uh, the, both the fields get benefit. So you don't have to do anything after a while. You, you just sit back and enjoy. <laughs>
And at some point, engineers use for the square root of minus one, they use the letter J, not I. Uh, French use I, of course, or so French mathematicians anyway. Uh, and here the J then, he said it's the square root of minus one. And I learned that from a chess, world chess champion. And this, I uh, understood what he was saying, but uh, he was using it as an analogy. I can't even remember exactly why, and that uh, fascinated me. But uh, I wasn't that, uh, firstly, I didn't realize you could be a mathematician as a professional. It was more like this is an easy subject and I don't have to worry about it. But as I say, the minute I learned abstract mathematics, I, uh, I gave up chess very quickly. This is, uh, there was a conference last week on this conjecture, which has got a lot of attention and I'm of course very happy with it. It's, uh, what it, what's kind of attractive about it is it explains conceptually the randomness. So there's a function called the Mobius function, which is very mysterious. And we all trying to understand it and it carries the mysteries of many things. And each time you learn something a little bit new about it, you can say usually something very, very profound. Uh, but it's a very hard function to understand even uh, what all these sort of secrets it carries are really well kept. And uh, I was listening to some, maybe Ben Green or Terry Tao talking about something and they were talking about the randomness and, and complexity of the Mobius function, uh, maybe eight, eight years ago. And I tried to understand what it was really saying uh, in a much more general context. Uh, and what they were doing in some special case. Mm -hmm. And I understood that one way to understand this is connected with entropy. And entropy is a very important uh, concept in dynamical systems. It comes from information sciences. And somehow uh, the entropy and uh, that this function is, uh, most of the things that we are learning about this function have to do we don't know how to understand this function, though there have been some interesting advances, as I learned last week, by the way, and this week there will be some lectures on it, so it's very exciting. That's one of the reasons I came here to see this. And I'm not involved in these things. I, this, I thought about it quite hard about for a good few years, starting six years ago. But I did realize that uh, the way to understand this is somehow the statistical disjointness between this mysterious function that we don't understand and some functions of, which are simple in the sense that they have low entropy. And the marriage of these two things is this conjecture, and it's very easy to state, so it's got a very attractive side of that, and if you really understand it properly, it would have profound implications. And most importantly, why I think there's uh, got a lot of attention is you can make progress on it. You can prove cases of it, so if you, make two, if you make a conjecture which is profound but nobody can say anything, then it just sits there. And it's, the way I was able to formulate this is you can make progress and uh, there's tremendous progress made. You can sort of build up cases in which you can prove it and sort of aim to get the general case. But it doesn't have to be that you've got the general case in one step, hopefully we'll get there, but you can make uh, very meaningful partial progress. And probably that's the reason that it's uh, attractive to many people because many people make partial progress by, by quite inventive methods, I must say. And uh, it's also a marriage of two fields, dynamical systems and classical number theory. And that's attractive to, as I, I said that earlier, both fields kind of uh, benefit and, and uh, after some time either this will be solved or it will be, we'll come to a point where we plateaus and we know this is as much as we can understand from this point of view. But I'm quite happy with the progress and I learned a lot, let me repeat that. Yeah. It's been a very interesting two weeks. Well, this is just the beginning of the second week, but uh, one of the reasons I came was to see where we're at, because I'm, I'm trying to catch up. <laughs> I'm, I'm way behind. <laughs> Uh, I've been looking at other things, yeah. It, and I remember very clearly, so as I said, somebody was lecturing, maybe it was Ben Green, and I, uh, he was making some, uh, something along these lines, discussing it, 
But he didn't have the notion of entropy in the picture. And it was clear to me that what he was saying could not be true if you had positive entropy. So, if the, so the real issue was to identify what's the mechanism of this thing being true. And uh, I then looked at some cases and understood this point. But I was too nervous to actually conjecture this thing in general because uh, a good friend of mine, Elon Lindenstrauss, a younger guy who's a world expert in dynamics, in this kind of dynamics, uh, kept on telling me that I don't know how bad, so I'm making a conjecture about something and about something that I don't know anything about. So you should, <laughs> so you say, he's warning me, you've never seen how bad a zero entropy system can be. And so it's probably false what you think. And so I was thinking about it for, I remember a long summer thinking about how to make examples. He gave me some potential counter examples. Uh, but at some point I saw some very simple implication from something that I have no doubt is true. Just my intuition is true and nobody else has any doubts either because I tell them they shouldn't have any doubts. <laughs> but it's kind of as a conjecture of Chala. And I found that if that were true and that nobody had made progress, and today these things are getting closer actually, but that sort of stood there with no progress on it. So that's why uh, what I was saying earlier, sometimes if you make something that you can't penetrate, then it just sits. Uh, but that conjecture, which uh, if it were false, it would mean that we all don't know something, that mankind hasn't seen something about whole numbers. That's, that would f appear very clearly when you looked at with the computers and things. You would quickly see this feature. If it, if it were false, I'm sure we'd know about it. So one believes that without much doubt, well, I, I do, as did Chala. And that implied this other statement. So then I was confident and I put out these conjectures, but I never expected the reaction. I gave a lecture in Jerusalem and uh, I, you know, these people blog and things like this and this went around like wildfire and uh, I got more attention than I ever dreamt. And hopefully it will lead up to, uh, I mean, it's already, I think the structure has emerged and uh, there's some very powerful mathematics that is now being brought to bear on it which had before was not clearly related. Well, I, firstly, mathematically, as I was saying, uh, it's been a fantastic visit for me personally, just simply because the topic is of such interest to me. I've learned a lot. I don't go to many conferences. I sort of uh, sit and hope people come to see me. And uh, so some of that, I've been spoiled maybe. Uh, because people do come to Princeton a lot, and so you see them coming through. But this was one of the few cases where it was clear to me I would come and benefit a lot. So I, I came here. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. It's extremely well run. The surroundings are fantastic. On the weekend, uh, uh, Lemanchik, uh, Marius took me and some others for a walk. And uh, it's a beautiful surrounding. And uh, I didn't know, I finally, I've, I, had, uh, I have back problems, so I don't travel much, but I now travel a little bit, very limited, and this is one of the places I came to. And um, uh, somehow I'd never been here. I've been to France many times, but I'd never come down here. And uh, it's uh, very functional. Uh, you know, we have these institutes around the world, but this looks to function quite a bit better. I mean, the housing and the environment and uh, being fed, uh, it's a bit of a problem that I think I'm, if you spend two weeks here, you put on a lot of weight. This I'm sure everybody complains about. <laughs>